That's yesterday's paper. I come from the north of England. We're underwater at the moment. Uh, thank you, Tom. So I'm going to go straight into um, a couple of case studies. As you will have heard, I uh, presently work as a consultant, and I used to work with large, large consulting organisations, and um, worked on large projects and bridges and things. Uh, but my very first project was the Thames Barrier. God. So, I mean, this is a good case study, and it was my very first job out of the university. So here we have a case for urban adaptation. Except this last weekend, I was at a 70th birthday party of the engineer who designed the gates for the Thames Barrier. And all the engineers there said, no, the Thames Barrier's got nothing to do with climate change. Anyway, it was designed in the 50s and after a London nearly flooded and started on site in the 70s. I was working there in 1980 and that's where this picture comes from. We've got completed piers over the other side and we're still working on these piers in the middle of the river here. It was great fun as an engineer just going to do the inspection of little boats and things and being transported by the tower cranes and cages. It was just a fairground. Um, and I got paid three times over the odds. They needed engineers to quickly save the capital. There was panic. There were sirens installed all on street corners. London was going to be completely inundated if we didn't get the barrier finished on time. And it was first used just after we finished it, about a year later. And so 2013-14, it's been used 50 times a year, not just to stop the water coming in from the North Sea, but to, for, because of floods coming down the river. So this is an essential part of our infrastructure now. What, what is now the norm was completely exceptional when we started. And the problems at the moment, how long is it going to last? Well, that depends on the codes. If we have the straight trajectory, it might last for 2070. But the question is, have we got that? Or are, have we got sea level rises changing differently from what engineers are expecting? So at the other end of my spectrum, and I'm sorry, Tan, if you have a fire in this building, those beams would take about four hours to burn through, whereas a steel beam would go in half an hour if they were unprotected. So, in fact, when it comes, you know, you, it would take a lot of burning to get rid of those. Um, I mean, it's great. Massive amounts of carbon stored in the building structure, superstructure. So, very green superstructure. The trouble is the foundations. You know, there are codes of practice, you know. One's got to have concrete in foundations, doesn't one? Now, actually, something I haven't really said in my, my CV, I don't think Tan mentioned this, I'm a conservation engineer. I work in restoring buildings, keeping them up. So I have to deal sometimes with buildings that may be three or four or five decades old. They've got con concrete foundations. Any other buildings, going back decades, centuries, they didn't have concrete foundations. We're tied in, as Daryl says, to the codes of practice that says you've got to have concrete in the foundations, because from 1950s, that's what engineers do. And why didn't, why not in the 1950s? But why are we having it now, still, 15 years after we started to worry about carbon? Okay. 
so just this is um, yeah David Lapp was bringing some of the subjects in that would, would have been nice to be talking about and I will mention these but not in the depth to which I would like to be discussing them. these are what we should be talking about probabilities how are we going to cut the emissions how are we going to make our buildings resilient I mean, that's what we should be really going for, and that's what this lecture should be about. The trouble is, there's this backward step. How, and is there any point in going in and too far ahead when most of the industry is lagging behind, saying, well, why should I do anything on a, to worry about climate change? It doesn't say I have to in the codes of practice. If my competitors aren't, why am I got to do it? So, Tan mentioned I'd just been involved with Forensic Engineering. We did a themed issue on defining the hazards for resilient design. There's been a few other lectures and things on resilient design. But the extraordinary thing is the lack of connection between resilience and climate change. So this, this is something we tackled head on and we mostly went... Um, so we were talking about the failure of flood defences. We just had one up in the northeast when there was a surge tide two years ago. It knocked down a, sec a, f a short section of wall, and the prime minister sent Chinook helicopters in to drop stones into the hole to try and stem the flow. Because each time the tide came in and went out, it made that gap bigger. There was, you know. So we're laughing, the fact that COBRA, which is the Prime Minister's chaired meetings in London, were discussing a little stretch of North Yorkshire. But of course, what it was doing was protecting the chemical industry up there. So it was fairly serious. It was great. We were talking to the chemical engineers, and we had a brilliant session on this. But um, Anyway, so failures from flood defences. You know, um, Yonkman was talking about what we should be doing cost-effective maintenance of our dikes. I mean, that's from around the world, from New Orleans and Germany. So, Antarctic ice sheets. Yep. The risks from extreme rainfall. I mean, Ty was talking about, we can't use one in a hundred storms. We've got to go out and use a totally different set of codes of practice when considering flooding from, uh, from rain. Rain doesn't behave like it used to. Uh, that's mainly set in the United States. Um, okay, I'm coming on to the discussion with experts and landslips. Yes, gosh, we're having them thick and fast in, in the north of e England. And heating of the globe, which we've, we've had that brilliant lecture uh, from Monsieur Pampon. Right, so I'm sorry. This is a bit interactive here. I'm seeking your opinions. Have we changed? So if we go back over the last 15 years, have you chaps seen any difference in the technology and the methods you are coming across within your fields so, can I please have a, uh, please can I get your opinion? Please raise your arms if you think that most engineers are trying to meet the challenge. Try. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we've got zero on that one. If you wouldn't mind recording these, Chad. Right. Yeah. So, please raise your arm if you think that most engineers have hardly started to make the necessary changes. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So that's twelve. Thank you very much. Well, that break the, break the, 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 the talk up a bit, didn't it? I'm afraid there's another of those coming. Um, right, so now we're looking at a review. I'm sorry about this slide, but... Just looking at what came through my letterbox or 
in trade in the last week or so that engineers in the UK are doing. Uh, I'm a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers, Structural Engineers and Highways and Transportation Engineers, so I've just looked through those journals. And what's on? I mean, the really good news is the Institution of Civil Engineers this week have got a fantastic conference organized. It's with uh, the United States and Canada. So it's a three-nation event. And they're looking at, um, uh, what do they call it? Resilience and growth of future cities. So that feeds into quite interesting question. Um, uh, that David Lapp was asking, you know, should <laughs> should we be building cities, developing cities where we haven't got the water supply? So, anyway, that's fantastic. We are actually discussing that. The slight drawback that I better mention, and I hate to be negative about this, is that I've tried to find out when was the last time that the Institution of Civil Engineers had a conference on that had climate change in the, con in, in the title and the library couldn't find anything and I think they've gone back 15 years or something. So this goes to show that this week is really good. So we can stick with a positive aspect but <laughs> some way to go. Um, yep. Yeah. So Swansea in Cardiff. Yep, they're looking at tidal lagoons. Brilliant. Fantastic. That's really what we need. Green energy. Wales, they're looking at the seas coming in and they're coastal. Brilliant. But the trouble is, yeah, these things are still hypothetical. We haven't got around to building any of them yet. So again, it's a bit of a repetition here. Shouldn't we have been doing this 15 years ago? The Institution of Structural Engineers. Fantastic green building for the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature. It's just things that I didn't really like to see was, okay, they've gone for green and it's all timber. Why have they gone for steel here? Makes you wonder what they've got in the foundations as well. And sure enough, that's explained. The structural engineer's role in BRIAM. Now, BRIAM is our sustainability code. The role of the structural engineer is very limited. And the typical points that may be awarded for a green building are negligible. When it comes to carbon content for BRIAM, I think it's about 7% of the marks. So whenever I come along and say, oh, I've done a nice green building, I'm going to get lots of green Brian points for this, they say, sorry, no, not relevant at all. The structural engineer has no role in creating a low carbon, a sustainable building under the present codes of practice. And the sustainability code is one of the most recent ones we've written. Unfortunately, I think the panel... As the concrete industry said, we are at the heart of sustainability. Now you can take that two ways. <laughs> they've made sure they're at the heart of sustainability. So they've, the sustainable, sustainability codes are designed to exclude high carbon construction. And that's something that worries me that Daryl mentioned that codes of practice are a little bit dated in my opinion and are not relevant. So, I mean that's that's the problem. Transportation. Now, John Dorr is talking transportation. And we've already had mention of, oh, gosh, yes, electric cars. And it's all there for the future. But when turning words into action, <laughs> these words would have been expected 15 years ago. Surely the action should have been decades. Well, we should have them up and running by now. Yes, so we have vote, uh, an annual vote of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And I've stood on a 
climate change ticket. That climate change is the most important aspect that engineers should be looking at. In 2013, I got 1% of the votes. So that's the votes cast. 2015, it went up to 3%. It's going to take quite some number of years before I get onto the council on that policy. So I'm a regional director. And if I'd gone and said, oh, I'm a regional director and I think that the status of engineering and their pay packet are really important, I'd have been elected. But if I say climate change is important, I get many more negative votes than I do positive votes. <laughs> So it's a question of green hush. It's not really open for discussion. Very few people would like to discuss it. Taboo subject. Um, so yes, the president, Professor Clark, came up to the northeast, and we had a discussion on resilience, on flooding, on how to protect the city. I mean, it was a really good lecture, series of lectures by five key panelists. But the five key panelists were asked, how much of this is climate change? And only one of them would admit that climate change had anything to do with the resilience that they've been talking about. So the other four, one of whom was complaining that he'd had two 100-year floods on his bit of road in the last year, denied it was anything to do with climate change. So... Can I go back to Daryl's question? See, I haven't. We didn't. We didn't <coughs> confer on this one. But can I ask, um, for a show of hands again on this one? What we have arranged is a number of seminars, getting opinions from engineers. Now, these are not experts in any particular field, and I, I'll come on to this one in, in a little bit later. But anyway, one of the striking things that one of the surprising results that came out of this was that the medium opinion was that 85% of the codes of practice that we are using are not fit for purpose when it comes to climate change. So when I say codes of practice, I basically mean everything that, we're, that you engin your engineers are using for your design. So, please can I ask you to raise an arm if you think this 85% is ridiculously alarmist. So, if you think that, yes, it's ridiculously high. Good, we've got one vote. Okay, I'm going to do the abstentions this time, so if you wanted to put... <laughs> so, um, please can you raise an arm if you think that the 85% sounds about reasonable. So, one, two, three, four, five. Five, if you wouldn't mind noting that. So, can we just have an extension, uh, abstentions on that one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, so the question is, are we yet heading in the right direction. My concern as a practicing engineer is that we're actually heading in the wrong direction. I got asked to design a, the restoration of a castle last year and I thought, great, you can see all the sockets for all the timber beams and things like this. This is going to be a wonderful project. But no, the rest of the design team were only interested if it was concrete and steel. We, um, yep, new buildings as seen in York. Yes, it's gratuitous use of steel. You know, we are now putting on steel that is not needed for structural purposes, but is there for ornamentation. Um, so the car use is growing, the price of fuels. I mean, I can't believe how cheap it was to fool my tank this, uh, this week. My central heating bill has gone down enormously. And we're on to 400 parts per million in the carbon. So, 
my um, my solution, my appeal to you. When engineers prepare risk assessments, which we have to do for every project, every, I mean every teacher, every professional has to do risk assessments now. Why is it that engineers can say, no, don't need to worry about climate change? They're two massive hazards that are completely exempt from all designs. I mean, both the dangers that our project is producing on other people in other parts of the world, why is that not relevant? And also, we're not considering, crikey, these cranky scientists that say that climate, you know, we might be getting sea level rise. Why are we not taking that into account? Why, when we're building um, uh, revetments to stop the, the, the North, sea side, North Sea surges coming in, they're exactly the same height as they were if we built them 20, 30, 50 years ago. There is no provision for unexpected developments from climate change. Now, in 2009, the Engineering Council UK issued very firm advice. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read this one out to you. Engineers should be taking a comprehensive risk assessment before each project begins and ensure that it includes potential environmental, economic and social impacts beyond the lifetime of the engineering project and it should recognise the potential for, well it says long term, I would have said short term as well, aspects and it says give sustainability and I, I would say, I don't know about sustainability, it's a word I stopped using, climate change, development, um, the benefit of the doubt. So I think this is really good advice. But the trouble is, it's been buried. It was not publicised. Even the people who had the job of publicising this left this section out. So it was... So the advice about climate change left out this incredibly important statement. Engineers are just brilliant at assessing risks, if you don't mind me saying so. I, I think that it's staggering how often we get it right. So a standard risk assessment, you know, we look at the feature, we look at the hazard, we work out a probability, we work out the danger from that happening, we work out whether we can get around it and what the residual risk is. And in my opinion, that would be fantastic if we started to do that for climate change. So, looking at some of the projects I've worked on, just on the risk element, I spent a lot of time working on high-rise buildings, you know, the, the large panel ones like Ronan Point. You remove one bit of the building and the whole thing unzips downwards and upwards. It's most spectacular and very frightening. Um, very scary, but the risks are going wrong. One in 10,000. Road accidents, again, they kind of work on one in 10,000 chance of it happening. Except on the railways. A little accident on a railway gets massive publicity, so they work on one in 100,000. Actually, John Doran might correct me on this one. Uh, chemical engineers, I said I was working with them on the other one, they work on one in a... A million. Yes, it does seem <laughs> So they are working on one in a million, and we're putting up the dikes to protect the chemical works that, in my opinion, are unlikely to survive more than a few decades. So, and um, there's been some mention of seeking opinions from engineers. The reason why I think it's not a bad approach 
is that engineers tend to give reasonable results, even if they don't follow the advice themselves. So that's fascinating. And I keep coming back and getting these answers from engineers. And the probabilities are just staggering and really frightening. And yet we're not addressing the implications. Um, now, they're not experts. But Ms. Monsieur Planton might be a little bit startled to discover that some, the only times we've actually been able to benchmark these opinions, they were phenomenally accurate and miles, you know, 40% more accurate than IPCC 2007. I mean, they got the where the ice cap would be absolutely smack bang on the trend line. And the IPC 2007, it was beyond the worst credible within three or four weeks of the publication date. Um, so, yes, those are the opinions of uh, engineers on the risks. And I've also sought it from uh, some of the world experts. I'm Dr. Hansen, I think most of the, I call him the godfather of climate change. Wadham, from the Professor Wadham from Newcastle and, and uh, Professor Nutty, who uh, I'll be just talking about in a couple of minutes. Um, so these are uh, other input. So when it comes to risks, you know, four in ten is usually the type of risk we get from engineers, 40%. <coughs> and the hazards. So the adaptation hazards. I asked this question of Professor Nutty, who uh, is Swiss and was the lead author for um, Working Group 1. Now, I said, well, should we be using the, the percentages and things in IPCC 2013-14? He said, oh, well, I think you should, engineers should be going to at least 95% of the worst credible suggested by AR5. That is very different from what most people would read into the, into the report. But it seems a pretty reasonable approach to me. So I'm just to recap, I'm suggesting that we should be including in our risk assessments the effect on the environment. I mean, there's some really frightening sums in this. And I'm not going to be alarmist by telling you what they are. But if you divide the number of tons from, um, from the graph that you put on for where we wanted to be, which line we were, how many tons of carbon dioxide to be emitted by the number of lives at risk and how much you get some absolutely shocking ratios. So every project that an engineer carries out will affect the environment. I was once talking to a chemist who said, no, climate change, we couldn't possibly be affecting the earth. So I did a sum, and I got my, my A-level student son to check it, and he got almost the same answer. How many... He said, you know, we, how could humans be detecting something as big as the atmosphere? If you divide the atmosphere by the number of people on the planet, do you think anybody... Just think about the answer. What would you expect? It comes out to less than one cubic kilometre. Now, when I have a bonfire at home, I need lots of cubic kilometres. I make sure the wind's going in the right direction. It's phenomenal to think that each of us is responsible for one cubic kilometre. So one engineer designing a building of several thousands of tons, <laughs> he, he's going to really blow his one kilometer, one cubic kilometer. 
So we have a duty to act for the good of all, in my opinion. So going back to the dangers, which was, I should have come, I should have now and then have a go back to this um, risk assessment, but the dangers, of course, is, is the, the, the crux, and you're not going to get this from any scientists. You, this is sticking your neck out and asking engineers for their opinions. So it's reasonable, but it's still shocking. So at two degrees, they reckon that 18%, this is the median response, 18% of the world will need to move. Now I wonder how many refugees are on the move at the moment from Syria, Somalia, and look at the problems we're having in, in Europe at the moment. It's going to be fun when that gets to 18 degrees, isn't it? 18% of the population, uh, which is what, 2 billion people. So, what percent of the world population are at risk for three degrees, a third of the world? And how many could survive five degrees, 45%? So, as soon as you start using data like that in any risk assessment, bam, you have got real mega problems. And it might put things into perspective. The time scales are very relevant as well when doing these. Um, right, yes, Paris, two degrees. Now, Noah published this graph a few months ago, which everybody thought we were at 0.8 degrees, and they said, no, oh, actually, no, that graph shows we're at 1.2 degrees, not 0.8 degrees. So, you know, if we're going to make two degrees, God, we've got to act quickly. Do we have time to go into buildings that are, uh, to look at the whole life of a building, which is what most sustainability codes look at at the moment? Um, so, it's the short term that is the worrying thing. If we can survive 120 years, uh, then engineers can, of the future can help. But I've got a nasty feeling that it's the short term that we really need to be worried about. I mean, the last IPCC report said that tipping points, no, nah, don't worry about them that much. They're highly unlikely to have a major effect. I, I find that very hard to believe. Um, so this is one aspect that the, 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 the Arctic um, cap, the North Pole. So this is the data. So the, the, the lower figure is volume. When I've got a gin and tonic in my hand, it's the volume of the ice cube I look at, not the area of the ice cube to see if it's effectively cooling my drink. And, yeah, so the biomass was an, a, an assessment of its volume, and it was not held to be very credible because it involved mathematics. But then they launched the, pyo, the cryo sat, satellite, and strangely enough, it said that the calculations were absolutely right. So there is a lot of credibility on this volume. And the curve is going down to 2004. So we've got nine years before the Arctic disappears, according to the lower figure. If you take the area of the Arctic in kilometers squared, we've got slightly longer. But of course, those two have got to come together at some point. When the volume disappears, the area disappears as well. So going back to the questioning of engineers, when I put that, when I showed them these figures, they don't believe it. They much prefer to go with the climate models um, that we, we had discussed earlier with Monsieur Planton. And they, all the climate models, are say, oh, we're 
the Arctic's going to last at least till 2050. What is the probability that the data here is less good than the climate models? And I'm very sure it's not one in a thousand, one in a hundred, or even one in ten. There is a real risk that the models are wrong if the data is, is showing something very different. So, I th conclusions coming. If you don't mind, I just summarise on this one. Engineers should be forced to carry out risk assessments that include climate change. And if they don't, they will be very liable. They've got to justify what they're doing. Otherwise, they, they will be held to account. It's not us that's going to be held into account. It's the next, the younger engineers. And they could turn vicious. What the heck have our generation been doing? And if we, have, if we say that they've got to do um, risk assessments, then we don't need any new laws. Everybody knows you've got to do risk assessments. Everybody knows about health and safety. So we don't actually need to pass masses of changes in an engineer's um, uh, lifestyle. Uh, the risks and the probabilities will be discussed. And you'll note I haven't... Yes, there's a lot more to be said about this. But... The important thing, I think, is that the risk assessments would override existing codes of practice. That if the risk assessments say, ah, look, the code of practice that says we can just use, uh, that doesn't mention the fact that we can use as much steel as we want in a building, says we've got to reduce it, then the risk assessment will override the, the code of practice. Um, so, and it's a very quick method of getting a result. And more importantly, when you've got a team of engineers who are rewriting the code of practice, and 93% uh, of them are sceptical about climate change, it prevents them rewriting the code to avoid the issue, which is what I fear is happening with codes that are under production at the moment. And... Um, anything that deviates and causes risk, of course, has to be justified. So I would beg uh, the World Federation of Engineering Organisations to please endorse what the UK Engineering Council said and reiterate the need for engineers to give and prepare uh, risk assessments. Okay, I've said that we should recognise they're doing nothing, but I don't really think that we we probably don't want to. <laughs> anyway, this isn't for me, but this is for discussion later. But I can see that there are might be problems with recognising how little we've done so far. Maybe maybe we think we should be saying that. Maybe we don't. But. The key aspect is that, like on the Thames Barrier, it's engineers that are needed to do this. We're the ones that control the water. We're the ones that stop the city's flooding. We are absolutely... I mean, we at the Institution of Civil Engineers, when I joined, we used to have a boat that boasts that engineers control the environment. Guess what? They dropped the boat. <coughs> I mean, it was a ridiculous boast, but there is an element of truth in it. So, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you'll listen to my plea. Thank you.